Um, so, hello everyone. We're starting our CMSA colloquium. Today, we're very happy to have Professor David Jordan as our speaker. David is a reader at the University of Edinburgh, School of Mathematics, and a member of Harsh Institute. He received his PhD from MIT in 2011. Then he became a NSF postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas before he joined the University of Edinburgh in 2013. Today, he will talk about uh, Lennon's duality for three manifolds. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. And, and uh, uh, thank you for the, the invitation to speak here. Um, so uh, this talk is about uh, Langland's duality and a, a new uh, instance of Langland's duality that, um, that we've um, uh, uncovered conjecturally with uh, some of my collaborators. And um, uh, it's in the context of something called skein modules, which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but uh, this talk won't really be uh, very focused on, on skein modules, um, but uh, rather will be a sort of colloquial introduction to uh, the history of Langland's duality. Um, however, the risk uh, uh, of organizing the talk that way is that I don't get around to stating the conjecture that I'm very excited about. So for that reason, uh, I'm going to start by, by sharing this conjecture, uh, and then we'll spend uh, the rest of the uh, lecture motivating it. Um, so uh, basic definition, um, uh, by the way, so it, this link here, uh, tiny URL, Jordan CMSA, if you're watching at home and you want to follow along um, independently of the screen share, you can, you can uh, go to that link and the notes will be available afterwards. Uh, so, um, skein module is a very elementary uh, uh, kind of invariant of a, of a three manifold. Um, so, the first and most well studied one is the SL2 skein module uh, uh, of an oriented three manifold M. And this is actually just a vector space uh, spanned by, uh, by links that are drawn. Um, drawn uh, on the interior of M uh, subject to certain relations. So we, we, we populate a vector space with arbitrary links that we draw in the, in the three manifold, and then we impose certain relations. Um, so these relations depend on a complex parameter A, which here is just some complex number. And the way to interpret these relations uh, is that uh, if I have some link, if I have three links in this case, if I have three links which uh, differ uh, inside some three ball uh, by the three uh, red uh, pictures, but are identical outside of the three ball, uh, then the skein relations tell us that we have a linear combination uh, like this. So a crossing in that ball can be resolved in the two possible ways and they get uh, weighted by this complex number A and A inverse. And another relation is that if we ever have uh, a little unknot sitting somewhere, we can erase that unknot and we get uh, a multiple, uh, a complex number, uh, quantum two. So this is um, is uh, is uh, Q plus Q inverse, and here Q is a squared. Uh, so that is um, is clearly a sort of invariant of the of the three manifold from the way it's defined, um, and uh, it, it's a vector space, uh, and it has this elementary description. Hey, hey, um, can I ask a? Sorry, hi David. Hi Ryan. Is uh, do you need a framing to write this relation? A framing on of the, the three links? manifold. No, you don't. No, so so these are oriented balls. We need an orientation of the three manifold, but we don't need a framing. Um, these are framed links, but I, I'll suppress that. So the links are really little bits of ribbon rather than um, than string. But I've drawn them thick enough with a thick pen, so you can't tell the difference. But no, it's not a it's not an invariant of a framed manifold. It's just an oriented manifold. Thank you for that question. Um, so this is the SL2 skein module, uh, but in fact, there's a skein module like this that we can define uh, for other groups. Uh, I just want to put one on the board um, to give you a feel for how they look. So the PGL2 skein module is a bit of a stranger thing. Um, 
it uh, has, it's again an invariant of an oriented three manifold. Uh, this time it's a vector space spanned by trivalent graphs uh, in M. Uh, and so we have things like this picture here. Um, and again, we have some sort of local skein relation. So I've just stopped drawing the, the black balls, but they, they should be uh, surrounding each of these things. And uh, there's some calculus for how you can resolve uh, crossings uh, in terms of uh, simpler pictures uh, that don't involve crossings. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, uh, as the uh, notation suggests, we can do this for every uh, reductive group G. So some, say, say a simple algebraic group G, if you like, uh, and uh, every complex parameter Q. There's some additional choices in the definition, but I'll suppress that. Okay, so from the way that these things are defined, uh, they uh, seem very infinite in nature. There's infinitely many links that you could draw, um, but uh, uh, a famous conjecture of uh, uh, Witten, which, which we proved uh, a few years ago now with Sam Gunningham and Pavel Safranov, uh, tells us that, um, the, that when this uh, parameter uh, Q, when the parameter Q is generic, um, uh, then actually, uh, and when the three manifold is closed, so has no boundary, uh, then uh, uh, the skein module that, that we define, in fact, for any G, these are all uh, finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, and so this is interesting because uh, it, it really depends on the parameter being generic. If you specialize the parameter to say Q equals one or to Q a root of unity, this fails. So it's, it's some kind of phenomenon about, uh, about quantization um, that, that quantization is giving us some, some additional structure uh, telling us that we have really finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, and uh, so I wanted to get this theorem on the board because it allows me to state uh, the conjecture, um, which, I, which I'm hoping to, to motivate with this colloquium, um, which is that if we take the dimension, so just the dimension, say, over the complex numbers of the skein module for the group G of some manifold M, the conjecture is that this is equal to the dimension of the skein module for the Langlands dual group for the same manifold M. Um, so these dimensions have been computed in, in very few examples uh, for any groups at all, um, but uh, a place where we can get a foothold in these conjectures and see if they, if they make any sense at all is if we consider the uh, case SL2, so I'll be saying uh, what Langland's dual group means in a second, but uh, in the case of G equals SL2, the Langland's dual is PGL2. And then the dimensions, uh, and if we consider uh, the three manifold to be of the very special form that we take a, some genus G surface and we cross that with S1, um, then uh, the conjecture holds. Okay, and I'm realizing now that I didn't uh, write down the dimension. I should definitely have done that, uh, but let's see if I can get it right. I tried to do this once on the fly and I got it wrong. So, so let's make sure we get it right. Um, so in both cases, you get an interesting formula. Two to the two G uh, minus one plus two G one. So let's see. So for genus one, this should be nine. Um, so I think I wanted, so two to the two G plus one plus two G minus one. Did I get that right? So two to the three plus two G minus uh, three. Sorry about that. Let's not worry about it. The, the, uh, the dimension is, is some uh, interesting formula of the genus. Um, in genus one, this should be nine. 
and uh, in genus zero, it should be um, one. And I'll uh, leave it to the uh, reader to um, make sure if I got the right formula. Um, so what I don't want to do is uh, is uh, explain how we prove this this theorem um, in, in great detail. I'll, I'll simply say that in the SL two case, um, this uh, this uh, was computed. Um, so for the SL two case, this was computed by Gilmer, Masbaum, uh, and Detry Wolf. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'll explain that the PGL2 case, um, uh, we could extract from this. Um, using um, ideas from quantum field theory. Um, David, yes. uh, has this conjecture uh, been tested for three manifolds whose homology group has two torsion? Um, like RP3. No, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, no, I would say that, um, Um, uh, no, no, I, I would say that the, that, the, uh, that the the evidence, the numerical evidence for this conjecture is uh, is really just this case and um, and uh, a, a not entirely trivial but somewhat special case of homology three spheres. Um, but so a case like RP3, uh, it would I think it would be great to to compute some uh, some of these dimensions. Um, yeah. yeah, I see, thanks. Uh, can you also maybe provide some uh, intuition uh, behind this theorem? So um, is the scale module quantizing some space and uh, is that space uh, compact or non-compact? Uh, the, the, the finite dimensionality conjecture? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of, uh, so, so this is a bit, uh, do you guys can put a bit of background on the, um, the finite dimensionality? Um, um, so in, indeed, uh, as, I'll, as I'll talk about a bit later, the, the G scan module of M um, is, a, uh, is a quantization in a certain sense of the, uh, of the character variety uh, log G um, Betty of M, uh, and that's a statement that, uh, that you can make sense of whether M is closed or not. Um, but, when, but when M is closed, you have to be a bit careful uh, because when M is closed, we have to ask what it means to quantize uh, uh, such a thing. So when, if M has boundary, then, uh, then this loc G Betty, of M is a Lagrangian in uh, the character variety of its boundary. Um, and this thing is symplectic. Um, however, when M uh, is closed, then instead it's what's called minus one shifted symplectic. Um, so if you quantize a Lagrangian in the ordinary sense, then you would expect a really good control on its behavior as you vary Q. You would expect a sort of flatness. Um, but if you quantize something which is minus one shifted symplectic, then essentially a minus one shifted symplectic uh, structure is like the intersection of two Lagrangians. Um, and, and what you can think about our, our result is saying is that if the quantization parameter is generic, then the two Lagrangians that you've intersected to define the, uh, uh, to compute the scan module are in sort of generic relative position. And so then the intersection is finite. 
And what happens when Q goes to one, say, uh, the, the intersection becomes non-generic and you get some, some pathology. Um, I think that's all I'd like to say about the, the finite dimensionality um, uh, 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 itself. Um, because uh, I want to, um, it's, it's, it's necessary to state our conjecture, but I really want to focus on the Langlands duality um, for the rest of the talk. Thanks. Okay. So, um, so I, I've been talking about Langlands duality. I want to spend a few minutes just saying what that is. Uh, so it's a, it's a, a pattern of uh, uh, conjectural uh, relationships that first arose in number theory and works of uh, Langlands, of course, uh, Andre Vey and Harish Chandra. Um, it uh, found new life in algebraic geometry um, in, in, a, in a conjecture of Balance and Drenfeld. Uh, and then a uh, refinement of that conjecture by Rankin Gates Gorey and, uh, and, a, and a variation by Benz V. Nadler. So I'll be reviewing those. And then uh, it, uh, it uh, found yet a third uh, life in, in quantum field theory, um, thanks to the work of Kapusin and Witten. And um, so uh, as, as we've seen, uh, we, we now have an appearance of that in the quantum topology of three manifolds. Um, and of course, that, that appearance is very much tied up in, in the, the, other, the other three. Um, so, uh, so Langlands duality, it relates a uh, group G uh, and it's Langlands dual. So they come in pairs like that. Um, and so examples of dual pairs, just to keep it in mind. So the group SLN is Langlands dual to PGLN. Uh, so those are both groups in type A, uh, but for instance, the symplectic group uh, uh, of rank 2N uh, is uh, in duality with the special orthogonal group of rank 2n plus 1. Um, so uh, the, 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 the groups that appear in this duality are not related in a straightforward way. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the typical relationship that you find in Langland's duality is that you're relating data that's uh, of rather a different sort on the two sides. Um, so uh, we'll be going through examples of this, but there's something called automorphic data that you want to attach to the group G. This has a sort of analytic uh, flavor to it. And then on the other side of Langlands duality, you have uh, what's called spectral or Galois data on the Langlands dual group. Um, and indeed Langlands uh, first observed that, that you could compute difficult quantities on the automorphic side in terms of um, possibly easier or more combinatorial uh, uh, questions on the spectral side. Um, a feature that you find in these, these patterns is that they have relatively elementary formulations, um, uh, but, but the methods that have been developed uh, in, in all the approaches to Langlands duality are, 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 are very deep and, and they point to structures that you, you may not have noticed if you weren't studying that. Okay, so uh, my plan is uh, having, having already stated our conjecture and, and some evidence for it, I want to survey some of the history behind the uh, behind Langlands duality, and uh, and if there's time at the end, I want to give uh, certainly not even a sketch of a proof, but uh, highlight some interesting ideas that uh, come into um, how we've thought about this conjecture, and in particular how we proved the special case. Um, so. Uh, just to dispel any mystery, uh, I want to say, how, what is this procedure to get uh, the Langland stool group from the original group G? Um, and so uh, for this, I want to recall that if we have a simple algebraic group, it's, it's classified by some, some, some data. Um, so we have its Lie algebra G, uh, and then we have uh, also to specify the fundamental group of, uh, of, the, of, of G, so pi one of G. And uh, from that uh, uh, data of the fundamental group, we can also determine the center of uh, G. So these are sort of, they're not, they're not the same group, but there's a, there's a way to determine one from the other. So equivalently, if we specify either of those, we've, we've fixed the group. Uh, so then uh, simply algebras uh, are, are classified uh, by, by some, some data. So there's a, a finite dimensional vector space, which is, essentially the carton of the, of the Lie algebra. 
Um, we have a set uh, phi of roots in the, in the dual. Um, we have a, uh, a symmetric bilinear pairing with some nice properties. And then uh, with respect to this bilinear pairing, we have uh, two types of roots that can occur. Uh, so long roots and short roots. So here's, here's an example. This is the group G2. Uh, and you see that there's, uh, there's long roots and there's short roots. And uh, that there's, not, there's only two possible lengths that can occur in a root system. Uh, and so uh, Langland's duality, um, so first of all, uh, two, if we have two Langland's dual groups, uh, we, can, we can identify their Cartan, uh, H, um, but what we exchange is the long and the short roots. Um, so uh, if I have a Lie algebra G, it's classified by a root system phi. So there's G, and it's determined by phi. And the Langland's dual Lie algebra it's just the Lie algebra that I get by swapping long roots and short roots. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, the, type, the type B, this is the type B series. So this is B2, uh, uh, and this is C2. Um, you see that uh, to get the uh, C2 diagram from the B2 diagram, just swip, swap the long and short roots. Uh, and so, so here's a sort of a playful picture of the duality that uh, here's a, a type B root system looking in the mirror and it sees its Langland's dual. Uh, so you notice right away that the type A root systems, and in fact, the ADE root systems are, are fixed by Langland's duality. So the Lie algebra doesn't, doesn't really change in some sense, um, but uh, it, uh, Langland's duality is still interesting even in the ADE case uh, because what happens is that the fundamental group and the center uh, get swapped. So the, the fundamental group of the Langland's dual uh, is, is uh, the same as the Pontryagin, Pontryagin dual of, the, um, of uh, the center of G. So the Pontryagin dual. Okay, and just to remind you, these are two, two finite groups that, uh, that, that um, for, for a simple algebraic group, these are necessarily finite. Okay, so I just wanna emphasize that this is a combinatorial prescription of what Langland's dual uh, construction looks like. Um, you note that it appeals to a classification. So uh, it's, it's not functorial in any naive sense. Uh, I didn't, if I have uh, a group uh, G mapping to uh, another group H, uh, the, there's no reason that uh, the Langland's duals will have maps in either direction. It's, it's not that sort of thing. It's, it's much um, more um, sort of mysterious in that way. Um, and certainly uh, there's no uh, easy relationship between the group G and its Langland's dual. And actually this fact is, the fact that there's no, that it's so hard to, uh, in an elementary way, say what the uh, relationship is between the group and its dual, I mean, there are better ways than this, but um, but still, there's there's no easy way to say it. Um, that's uh, that's part of the mystery that that such unrelated groups can appear um, uh, in, in this way um, throughout different walks of mathematics. Um, so let me uh, spend some time now. Um, now that we know uh, what the Langland's dual group is, let me talk about uh, how the duality manifests in the, uh, in the original case uh, that people studied, which is in number theory. Um, and I wanna stress that I'm not an, an expert in number theory. Um, uh, if anyone uh, catches me saying something uh, foolish, please just, uh, please just um, speak up. Um, so this was, uh, so, so these ideas were, uh, 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 motiva motivations for Langlands, and there's a lovely letter that Langlands wrote uh, to Andre Vey, um, which is, I think, where the, this, um, uh, this whole story got started. Okay, so uh, in, in algebraic number theory, we're typically, uh, one is typically concerned with uh, a number field F. Um, so, um, so to, to remind you by a number field, I mean a finite field extension uh, F uh, containing Q and sitting inside C. Um, so we want that the um, degree of F as it sits over Q is, is finite. 
Um, and then uh, uh, the, the ring of Adele's uh, of, of this uh, number field. Um, so it sits inside the product over all the places of the number field. Um, and uh, we take F and we complete it at P. So this is the completion. Place P. Um, so if this language of places is unfamiliar, you can think that uh, if F were Q itself, then uh, the uh, each of these FPs would be the um, the uh, piadic uh, numbers, and uh, and uh, this is some generalization. So we have some generalization of a prime, which is called the place, and we can do completions there. And so uh, if I take uh, an element in here, it's a list of some elements A, a sub P, um, and the, the uh, condition uh, is that uh, I want A sub P to actually lie in the, the ring of integers um, uh, of, of FP um, for all but finitely many P. Um, so, um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm not going to talk too, too much about the motivation why, why one studies the ring of Adele's, but we'll see a, a geometric incarnation of this uh, in a little bit. Um, but uh, I guess what I, what I want to say is that somehow you're trying to study this number field geometrically uh, by thinking about the uh, sort of infinitesimal neighborhoods of every, uh, of every possible prime um, in, in, occurring in the field. Um, and so what Langlands was studying is what are called automorphic representations. Um, so this is an important, uh, important notion. Um, and so an automorphic representation just means that we look at uh, the, uh, the, the group G, so we have some group G attached to our number field, and we wanna look at how it acts on uh, L2 functions of uh, G of, uh, it's, so, uh, on itself, modulo G of F. Um, so those are called automorphic representations. And uh, sitting inside there are uh, functions on a certain coset space. Um, where I uh, quotient further um, by, uh, by a G of O action on the right. Um, so this is some, uh, some really intricate uh, uh, sort of uh, analytic space uh, that, that one wants to study. And um, uh, the, the uh, unramified representations, um, so, so first of all, the automorphic representations are all the representations V, which occur inside of L2 functions. And, uh, and if uh, V occurs inside the orbit of uh, these uh, uh, doubly invariant uh, uh, functions, then these are called unramified. Okay. So the talk just got a little bit cloudy there, um, but uh, that's okay. Um, because uh, I, I really wanted to just uh, affix the, the symbols uh, and the, the impressionistic form of, of these quantities that arose in number theory. Um, and we'll see how they appear again in the geometric context. context. Um, so uh, Langlands proposed that we could study these uh, by studying something uh, much, uh, at least to, to an algebraist like myself, much less daunting, uh, 
um, which is we could study the Gawa group of uh, our field over Q. Um, and then we could look at homomorphisms rho from our Gawa group to uh, a group defined over C. So that's also a bit less daunting, um, but the catch is that it's uh, the Langlands dual group. So we're looking at certain kind of representations for G valued in this uh, adelic ring. And we're, uh, we're trying to relate those to representations uh, rho of the Galois group into uh, say the complex form of our, of our Langlands dual group. And indeed, so he, uh, he proposed that there should be a duality relating automorphic representations of G to uh, Galois representations of uh, the Langland stool. Okay. And so this, uh, this uh, was sort of first proposed in this letter in 1967. And there's many special cases, uh, important special cases where it's known, um, but in the sort of generality that, that we've, we've talked about, this is just a completely open question in number theory. And I think a very interesting one. Um, so uh, this conjecture inspired uh, uh, a conjecture of uh, Balenson and Drinfeld in, in algebraic geometry. Um, and so the ingredients at first sound quite a bit different. Um, so we consider a, a smooth projective curve X uh, over C, so algebraic curve. Uh, and, uh, and what they essentially noticed is that if we study the moduli space, oops, that's a Freudian slip. I wanted to write bun G and I started to write Ben's V. That's funny. Um, David will enjoy that. Um, so, so bun G, this is a, uh, this is a uh, moduli space of uh, holomorphic uh, principal G bundles. On X. So we think about X as some uh, algebraic curve, and then we've got some fibering of it with G. And so there's a well-known uh, way to think about this. Uh, so if I let uh, K uh, denote uh, the rational functions on my algebraic curve, um, then uh, bun G of X, uh, can be written in a very similar way. So I take G of the Adels of K, I quotient by G of K, and then I also quotient by G of O. Okay. Um, so really what this is saying is that any, any G bundle, I can uh, puncture the curve at finitely many places. So that's where the Adels come in. Uh, and then uh, the thing becomes trivial. So that's, that's why we all need to consider about, uh, think about G of the Adels. Um, and then um, I need to sort of uh, get rid of that trivialization data. Um, and there's, there's a, a local part of the problem which is controlled by G of K. And there's a, a global part of the problem which is controlled by G of O. And so you see uh, th they made this observation that the automorphic uh, uh, representations of uh, G um, based on a number field F uh, had some kind of interesting analogy with uh, the space bun G of, uh, of an algebraic curve, uh, uh, even though the, the field K that arises is, is certainly not a number field. Um, and uh, and they, they also uh, were, were well aware of a uh, sort of an old uh, um, parallel that probably goes back to Grothendieck maybe earlier um, to, that we can think of the Galois group. So the um, Galois uh, reps of, um, of F over Q. Um, one should think about these as uh, being related to um, uh, to analogous to homomorphisms from the fundamental group 
So the, 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 the fundamental group is in some sense the topological Galois group. Uh, and so we can relate those two maps from the fundamental group to the Langland stool. Okay. So this is an important player in the story um, and I'm gonna give it a notation, uh, loc G Betty of X. Um, so Betty here uh, refers to the fact uh, that we're talking about the fundamental group. Um, and uh, I'll be contrasting that. Um, so uh, later on, we'll see um, a slightly sneakier object, which is um, log G Duran of the same curve. Um, but this is, uh, th this log G Betty is something quite elementary. We, we, the fundamental group of, of the surface is just, it, it, it's an algebraic curve, but we just treat it as a surface. So that's quite elementary. Uh, it has a finite presentation and then we're just studying maps. For, it's just, a, it's, it's really just a, a um, finite type variety uh, quotiented by a, by a group action. Okay, so they set up these parallels here uh, and then they made this uh, very nice conjecture, um, which says that uh, if we look at, uh, okay, so a category of what are called D modules on bunch G of X, that this category is equivalent to um, category of quasi-coherent sheaves on loc uh, G Duran of X. And uh, so I, sh I should now clarify um, that uh, th there's, um, so maybe now let me um, spell out a little bit more. Um, so, if loc G Betty is, uh, is representations from pi one of G into the, the Langland stool, loc G is certain um, um, uh, uh, GL bundles with a flat connection. Nabla, so G, GL bundles E with a flat connection on E. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so, so somehow this is a sort of differential geometry uh, version and this is a sort of uh, um, uh, homotopy theory uh, version of, of the same problem. Okay. And so motivated by these analogies uh, and, and some other ones that I won't go into, um, they, uh, they pose this uh, duality. And I think uh, underlying this is a, is a, is a deeper uh, a duality that, that underpins a lot of this that I want to just get on the board. Um, so uh, this is uh, Kapranov, Mazur, and Reznikov in various of their uh, writings that uh, number fields F uh, are actually uh, um, related to uh, three manifolds. Um, yeah. Okay. And now, um, in order for me to claim that there's a relationship here, you might be a bit confused because where is the um, where is the uh, three manifold? Um, so I, I want to um, point out that the, the three manifold M here is, is really uh, X cross S1. Um, and uh, the, the, so one example of the sort of thing to notice is that uh, a category of D modules on something, um, uh, this, is a, this is a sort of categorification of functions on the same gadget um, in a way that, that I won't go into. And this sort of categorification um, arises um, from that fact that we've crossed with a circle. 
Um, so I think a point of view, uh, it's, it's certainly not original to me, but it's one that I want to um, express is that, uh, in fact, the, 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 the first landing place for uh, Langland's duality and algebraic geometry, uh, it really landed in dimension two, uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it landed in dimension two just because uh, we should take this, uh, this algebraic curve X and we should try to cross it with a circle. Um, and uh, so in, in this tour of, of geometric Langlands and algebraic geometry, the, the final stop is, is uh, um, a proposal of, of Bensby and Nadler, um, which has certainly um, influenced a lot of how I think about these, these questions. Um, so uh, instead of studying D modules, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Before I state this, I, I want to uh, make a, uh, a, a, a an advertisement. So uh, the conjecture that I wrote here is is how it was uh, sort of uh, posed uh, by Balenson and Drinfeld. Um, in a subsequent work by Arinkin and Gatesgory, um, it was uh, realized that this is this is not quite right, and there's some additional data that needs to be added here. Um, so. Um, there's a, a condition involving the unipotent cone, and there's some categorical um, uh, corrections that need to be made here. And, and I, I wanted to say that only to say that I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Um, so, so some some dualities that I express need to be corrected in that same way, and I, I just won't I won't talk about it um, in this colloquium. Um, so, so with that caveat, um, so Benzvi and Nadler. Uh, proposed uh, something which is uh, quite a bit more elementary in some sense uh, than the uh, Balenson and Trinfeld uh, picture, but still very um, enticing. Um, so uh, we could study uh, sheaves on bun G. Now this, uh, these are uh, just sheaves of vector spaces. Um, so D modules are uh, some sort of systems of differential equations that are, uh, that are quite elaborate. Um, and, uh, and there's a, a big simplification of this, which is we look at the same space bun G, but we just consider uh, certain sheaves uh, on there um, that have a more combinatorial flavor. Uh, and uh, they propose that the, this category of sheaves on bun G um, would be related to, well, again, quasi-coherent sheaves, um, but on the, uh, on the Betty uh, version of, of the same curve X. And so, uh, and so the point is that if we look at D modules, so we look at the original uh, Balance and Drinfeld conjecture, Um, we can think about the Benz v. Nadler conjecture um, as, as coming through the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. But, but in an interesting way. So if I have a system of differential equations with some good properties, I can uh, integrate uh, over Bunge. Um, and likewise, if I have a uh, uh, a uh, flat connection, I can integrate over X. Um, and so in this way, let me just check the time. Okay. So in this way, um, they, uh, they uh, said, well, let's look at this, at this uh, other side of the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. Let's work out what the um, conjecture says there. And, um, and it, it may not be completely clear from the way I'm presenting it, um, but at least in principle, uh, these are much more elementary um, um, objects. So for example, this, this space, this uh, space of Durham local systems is some sort of infinite type uh, a stack. It's, it's, um, 
it's, it's very challenging even to write down good definitions of what this category of quasi current sheaves is. Whereas I've already, as I've already explained, the, um, the Betty side is, is like a finite, finite type variety or finite type stack. Um, and, and again, here, um, instead of st studying arbitrary systems of differential equations, we study uh, their space of solutions, which is just a nice combinatorial thing. Okay. Um, despite the fact, let me emphasize that this is still open. I mean, uh, it's, it's, there, there's some uh, nice uh, work in uh, genus one um, by uh, Lee and I think Nadler. Um, there may be some more, uh, some more results, but even this uh, most elementary formulation is, is, still, is still open. Okay, so the thing that really um, uh, brings, uh, brings us towards uh, the, the conjecture on skein modules is this work of Kapustin and Witten. Um, so they uh, propose a completely new way to think about, uh, about geometric Langlands conjectures. Um, I'll say what I mean by quantum in a minute. Uh, and they did this in the language of uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory. Um, so, um, sorry, ignore that. Uh, let's just not worry about that. I was giving a bit too much detail. Uh, so they're studying a uh, quantum field theory, uh, which is which has the physicist notation n equals four, uh, d equals four, super Yang Mills theory. Um, so the n refers to the fact that this is super symmetric, so that it has a certain collection of what are called supercharges. Um, that, that act on the theory. Uh, D equals four just means that it's an invariant of some kind of four manifolds. Um, and uh, and uh, so th they, were, they were studying this theory and um, you can use these supercharges to construct a family of what are called twists of this physical theory. And these twists uh, in their construction depend on a parameter psi Which is naturally regarded as a uh, as an element of CP one, so it can be a complex number or it's allowed to be infinity, and a, a sort of very uh, well understood uh, construction in in physics tells you that if you have one of these twists psi, then you can construct a, a what's called a topological quantum field theory, C G psi. Okay, and so uh, topological quantum field theory is some kind of functor from, uh, in, in this case, four manifolds, some suitable category of four manifolds uh, to some suitable category, some sort of a linear category. So say the category of vector spaces or the two category of categories, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a prescription for turning um, topology into algebra. And um, what was uh, really remarkable about their uh, proposal is that um, these theories C, G, Psi were, uh, were argued uh, using ideas uh, from physics um, to be equivalent uh, under the application of Langlands duality. So I've said already what, uh, what the Langlands uh, dual is, uh, the Langlands dual group is, and then uh, Psi uh, L here is just defined by the equation that Psi times its Langlands dual is equal to minus one. Okay. Uh, so, so this S duality is a, is, a, is a notion coming from physics and, it, and it, uh, it, it tells you, it predicts a relationship between the group G and its Langlands dual. Um, and if we look at the level, again, going back to, uh, to surfaces, uh, uh, by surfaces here, I really mean algebraic curves. Um, what happens is that if we run the G theory 
at psi equals zero on some uh, curve X, uh, this is uh, uh, QC, cloak G Duran of X. And if we run the uh, Langland's dual uh, side at psi goes to infinity for the same space, then uh, we get uh, D modules on Bungie. Okay, so uh, what he did is he, uh, what, what they've done is they've, um, they've uh, just given some physical um, uh, justification for the original uh, valence and Renfeld uh, conjecture, um, but there's something more that happened because they introduced this parameter psi. Um, and so you can ask, well, what, what sort of balance and Drenfeld type description do you have uh, when you turn on the psi? And the remarkable thing is that you get an extra symmetry. So there, this, this category of D modules, as I said, it's some sort of uh, collection of, of, um, of differential, uh, differential equations that, that, that we can write down. It can be twisted by the parameter psi. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we can consider the exact same thing twisted by the parameter psi dual of bun g dual of x. Um, and you see that when we make psi, when we take psi away from these special values that, that people were focused on before, away from the values psi equals zero and psi equals infinity, uh, the Langlands duality becomes actually more symmetric than it was um, to, to, to begin with. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I wanna make sure that we have time for a conversation. So I think I'd like to, to sort of uh, to, to stop there. Um, and I just want to um, take us back to that opening slide. Um, Right, so uh, I made this point throughout the talk of saying how uh, Langland's duality really is expected to relate things that are of a very different flavor, automorphic on one side and uh, spectral on the other side. Um, and yet the conjecture that I, that I called Langland's duality actually relates two things of the same type, the skein module for G and the, the very same skein module, but for the Langland's dual. Um, and uh, uh, what I wanna uh, sort of uh, stress is that the, that the way that one can think about this conjecture is to think about uh, the Kapustin Witten story uh, with generic parameter psi, but uh, thinking about the, um, Benz v. Nadler side of that. So that gives rise to a, uh, a topological field theory. Um, and uh, and uh, when the parameter psi is generic, that corresponds to this parameter Q being generic. And that corresponds to, um, uh, that, that induces this additional symmetry. Um, so I'll stop there, thank you. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so nice talk. Um, so this skein module, is this what this uh, kapustin witten twist assigns to the three manifold? Uh, yes, thank you. Th thank you. That, in some sense, that's, a, that's like a planted question. That's a great question. In some sense, that's the point of this talk. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, kapustin and Witten, it's interesting. They, 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 rephrase the geometric Langlands program in terms of this four-dimensional field theory. Um, there's, uh, of course, some handle on the partition function for four manifolds, and then they uh, postulate that the value on surfaces is, uh, you know, these two sides of the geometric Langlands program. Um, but in fact, in that paper, they just don't touch the Hilbert spaces attached to four manifolds. 
it's a three manifold, excuse me. So there should be a vector space attached to three manifolds. And, uh, and another way of, uh, you know, a sort of meta conjecture that would imply this conjecture is that, uh, and indeed that's what I'm meaning to assert, properly interpreted skein modules are the Hilbert space of, uh, of, uh, of the Kapus and Witten theory. Um, there's some caveats there. Uh, first of all, um, what I've been calling is the skein module and what people usually study, there's something called a derived skein module. So this is the zeroth uh, homology piece of some, some infinite uh, uh, homological tower. And, uh, and so it's really that uh, derived skein module, which, which will be infinite dimensional, but finite dimensional in each cohomological piece that, that follows from what we, what we proved. Um, that, that derived skein module for generic parameters of psi is, uh, is, is our, in some sense, is our proposal for the, for the, the Hilbert space attached to three manifolds. Um, and I wanna stress again, uh, okay, so that's for generic psi, what about psi equals zero and psi equals infinity? Actually, that's still an open question. So um, the, uh, uh, you know, even at a physical level of rigor, I mean, uh, saying, giving some description of the uh, psi equals zero and psi equals infinity uh, space of states is, is, is an open uh, uh, direction of research. Thanks. Uh, oh, one more question about that. So, can you can you relate this uh, skein module to some kind of like Crane-Yetter type theory? Uh, that's what I would have guessed when you first showed me this relation. Something based on uh, rep UQG. That's right. Yes. So this is uh, so so that's uh, that's the content of of uh, uh, a lot of our earlier work. That that's right. So. So Crane-Yetter theory was sort of originally formulated for modular tensor categories, which are which are sort of very small objects in a sense. Um, but formally speaking, if you apply the same mathematical tools that you use to define Crane-Yetter, uh, you get uh, a, a, a 40 extended topological field theory, um, which which we constructed in, in some of our older papers. And indeed, I, I, I suggest to think about that as a version of, of Crane-Yetter. Um, it's not fully dualizable. So it's a four dimensional theory, but the partition functions that you get are not a priori well defined. I see. So that's how you, that's how, um, well, this theorem that you have written here uh, with Gunningham and Safranov, do you, do you sort of prove it that way by showing that like circle times three manifold partition functions are finite? No, actually, uh, it's, it's the other way around. So, right. So, uh, the, the object in question really is, is genuinely not fordalizable. Um, in fact, the, the form of these, this, uh, this formula here, um, as I think actually once do explain to me um, uh, in a very helpful conversation we had many years ago, this formula tells you, this formula for two manifolds tells you that this can't possibly come from a mathematician's fully extended four dimensional TFT. Um, if you would assume that the four dimensional TFT existed, then you could compute these dimensions by doing some sort of pair of pants procedure. And, uh, and you know from uh, just the classification of, of two dimensional um, topological field theories that you can't possibly have a situation where you have a dependence, an exponential dependence on a genus together with a, a linear dependence. Right. Um, so this cannot be a fully extended four dimensional TFT. And yet, uh, you're absolutely right, and you can interpret what we've said as saying that this thing, which by all rights should diverge, is actually uh, is actually convergent. Um, this is maybe not so surprising. I mean, the the, the Tia Siegel Lurie sort of axiomatics that mathematicians use for um, for topological field theories are, they're just stronger than the, the physicist's notion of a TQFT. So it's, it's completely conceivable to me that this is a well, that there is a well-defined uh, partition function, even mathematically. Um, and yet the sort of locality that you ask for in fully extended TQFTs doesn't, doesn't apply to it. I think that's the sort of thing that's going on. I agree, yeah. It's very interesting. 
So okay. may I ask a couple of questions? So um, uh, in the coupling with framework, as duality uh, at the level of Riemann surface would uh, have uh, would lead to a statement between categories, right? And one would expect that at level of three manifold, it should be a statement about vector spaces, not uh, just their dimensions. Uh, and do you uh, see a way of uh, actually creating isomorphism between the derived scheme module? That is uh, another fantastic question. Uh, so I was I was very uh, careful to state the conjecture this way, um, and um, of course, yeah, it's it's an excellent question. I mean, I, I've just told you that these are finite dimensional vector spaces, and I've told you that they have the same dimension. So of course, there are isomorphisms, um, but um, uh, I, I think that um, writing down, I think that determining uh, either from any of these other conjectures or from first principles, a natural isomorphism, uh, say natural in the three manifold M um, between the uh, G skein module and the, and the Langlands dual skein module. Um, I think that that's, that's a really, really challenging problem. Um, the, 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 the one, one uh, reason to, to note that, uh, uh, which, which you're, you're well aware of, is that this parameter Q that appears in the, in the story of skein modules is like E to the two pi I psi, say. Um, which means that the Langlands dual parameter is uh, E to the two pi I uh, sort of minus one over psi. Um, so so the, the transformation that you do in the parameter Q is, is highly non-algebraic. It's transcendental in Q. Um, and, uh, and that also fits with the story that I'm only making a claim about the generic dimension and this identity breaks down um, for any particular values. Um, so these, these skein modules are, are they're, they're really, um, prickly spaces. They're, they're finite dimensional generically, um, but, uh, but they're, they're not finite uh, dimensional at, at special values. And so, you know, any kind of, let me put it this way, th this relationship tells you certainly that if you would express such an isomorphism as a function of Q, you know, the, if, if you would choose a basis on one side and a basis on the other and write down the function, that that thing had better be transcendental, some kind of transcendental special function in Q. Um, and uh, I think it's a great, great question to, um, to wonder um, what, what nature it, it, it will have. Um, you know, maybe in the case uh, that, we've, that we've, we've focused on of a, a, a three manifold, which is a surface cross S1, you might hope that the uh, geometric Langlands conjecture uh, together with, uh, you know, just this crossing with the circle action would give you some, ex you know, some kind of explicit formulas um, that would that would involve, you know, trace sums and all kinds of interesting um, uh, geometry. Um, but at the level of a general three manifold, no, it's 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 not clear to me, um, you know, that it, it's not clear to me where to start looking for such a formula. Thanks. So you, you mentioned that the coupling with framework will make the um, geometric long lens uh, symmetric. Is there a way to also extend this to the original long lens program uh, and make that also symmetric? Uh, that's another really nice question. I've, I've asked that to, um, to a few people, um, but I, um, I'm always just told it's a nice question and they don't know. Um, I'm not sure what what form uh, to look there, but I think it's a great question. I, I wish I'd had time to mention that the geometric Langlands program was an analogy, uh, of course, of the original program, but it's paid lots of dividends. So the the proof of fundamental lemma, uh, in, which is a purely number theoretic statement, is is uh, is um, inspired by geometric Langlands. Um, there's recently been just an explosion of work by by too many people to name. Um, uh, which is about trying to uh, apply this geometric intuition to the number theoretic problems. Um, but as far as the quantization and the Kapus and Witten story, I'm not really aware of one. I, I, well, I, I would say that, I mean, in some sense, the, this, this program of Menyon Kim about arithmetic quantum field theory, I mean, it, it certainly, 
is certainly you know uh, tied up in those ideas, um, but I don't know a precise statement. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, if not, let's thank the speaker and finish the course.